Welcome to Keep Your Thrive Alive. I'm Mark Mulligan, and this is the space where I share inspiration, tips, and ideas to boost your mood, your energy, and your well being. Today, I'm delighted to have Richard Odufisan with me. I first met Richard when he selflessly volunteered to be a champion in the rollout of a thriving well being program at Deloitte. I was at once impressed by his gravitas and his passion to help others. He's a committed inclusion advocate and also the Black Action Plan Implementation Lead for Consulting in Deloitte. Richard, it's great to have you here. I'm really excited about this conversation that we're going to have. Like 2020 was a huge year for racial consciousness across the world with the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement. From your perspective, what's the intention of the movement? For me, this year, um, like you said, has been a great movement um, in terms of raising that understanding. The movement is all about raising that awareness of uh, the, the differences and experiences and how, despite the fact that we want everyone to have a certain level and opportunity in life, um, currently that's not the case for black lives and wanting to address that so that we move from it's not quite an only Black Lives Matter movement, it's Black Lives Matter as well. While also trying to diffuse the challenges, we have seen an increase in the tension. So Richard, it's a little bit depressing, isn't it? That there's been an increase in awareness, but it's also resulted in an increase in tension. If we want to shift the dial from tension to trust, what do we need to pay attention to? For me, I think this is, this is such a great uh, question because it's about looking at this journey like a lot of times when people come at this they're thinking of the one step what is this grand solution that fixes racism that fixes all of this tension um, but it is this journey it takes that time it actually can feel a bit awkward and a bit tense and that's how you end up with people who just are really keen to do something but are so afraid of not doing the wrong thing I know from my own experience, you know, when the Black Lives Matter movement started initially, I really wanted to do something. I felt very strongly about it, but I also felt fearful of doing or saying the wrong thing. And in my case, fear won out and I ended up doing nothing. So what is it that each of us can do if we're to play our own part? How do we have those conversations that may not necessarily have a huge move, but little by little, we start to build that understanding, we start to build that respect for each other, that view of each other's experiences to the point where we trust each other. I love it. From tension to trust, one conversation at a time. Brilliant. So what would be your three tips of how it is that you'll actually do that in practice? So I think with everything, the first step is just to get started. Like how do we have that first conversation to break the ice, make it feel a bit more comfortable. Then when you're in that space, how do we then nurture it? How do we grow it into something that's actually more meaningful, that, uh, that goes beyond just a surface level? And then once we are there and in that space of, right, we are getting into the deep nitty gritty of it, how do we make it productive? We move it out of the conversation to actually taking action. So let's start with getting started. But from your perspective, what is it that might be holding people back? I think that awkwardness, right? Imagine that same feeling you have on a first date where you, you want to impress. You clearly are looking to connect, but you don't know where to start. You don't know where, is, where the boundaries are, how far is too far. And what tends to happen is, you know, you're sat there with your coffee awkwardly making the worst small talk possible. And I think that's helpful for people to know that it's a similar experience for everybody. So if that's what stands in the way, what would be helpful? You have to come at it with a certain level of vulnerability and grace. Right? And this isn't just from the person who's wanting to know, but it's also the person who's being asked. If I'm coming to you from this space of I really want to know, and in that I am acknowledging what I do not know, I'm acknowledging my ignorance, I have to be vulnerable uh, in that, but equally the person who's opening up to you, you are revealing so much of yourself, so much of you that you may have kept hidden for reasons of safety or for, for that feeling of fear of standing out too much, 
and again being rejected. But the other side of that coin is the grace because you can't ask someone to be vulnerable without giving them that grace to occasionally step back if they need to. It is terrifying to be vulnerable. It doesn't matter what situation you're in. So whether you are the person asking and entering a space that is completely foreign to you or the person who is opening up a part of their life that is precious and personal, there needs to be that grace that says you go at your pace. Share as much as you feel comfortable to at this point and I will be patient with you. I love that. So vulnerability, grace and patience as a way to approach these sort of conversations. So moving on to this second area about how it is that we can develop an understanding and trust. I'm curious in exploring that and I just remember this experience uh, when I was in my old business and I went with my ex-business partner to pitch to a client and they asked us about our diversity philosophy and my business partner he said you know I don't see colour he said and it was really interesting because I think that his intention was very positive and he was pretty much saying I don't discriminate when it comes to somebody's colour but I'm curious what do you feel when you hear a phrase like that? I, I smiled a little uh, when you said that because I've, I've definitely seen this before and I understand the intention behind it. But the problem with that phrase is what you're saying is I don't see a part of you. I don't see something that is you. Um, and it's, it's important. It's not about necessarily ignoring our differences, but actually accepting that we are different and acknowledging that, celebrating it. So... Let's name our differences, because on the face of it, we are quite different, aren't we? I mean, you're... I'm black. Yeah, I'm white. Uh, I am a straight man. I'm gay. Uh, I am British Nigerian. I'm Irish. I'm privately educated. I was state educated. I am young and fly. Okay, so that makes me middle-aged and dry. Okay, thanks very much, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> so... What about other differences between us in terms of how it is that we might have to or feel that we have to behave? Yeah, there is, there's a lot of behaviours that we are taught from young. Um, I say we, as, as a tall-ish black man, mm. um, I have to be a lot more aware of how I come across uh, to others. So whether that's walking uh, on the street, I have to be aware, do I... Am I wearing a hoodie? Do I have it up? Other people around you may feel threatened by me. So you think about how safe other people feel around you. Whereas for me, if I'm out late at night, my concern is predominantly how safe do I feel? Okay, wow. What else? Um, I mean, even this voice, right? Uh, the, this has kind of been put on because it's a, a safer, more secure sounding voice. When people hear this, they think, yeah, this is a professional. This is someone who I can take business advice from as opposed to like the South East London voice, you know, like you, you hear this and you've just got the assumptions that come with it. Wow, that's a big difference because I've actually consciously held on to my Irish accent and for me, it's part of my identity. And I think the, the choice is still there, but it's more around what choices do you have to take to give yourself the best opportunity? Um, and for me, the voice is, is definitely one of those. So there are lots of differences, you know, differences in terms of how people would perceive us, but also differences in terms of how we feel we have to behave. It is so much better when you can find that, that, that connection point and suddenly the differences are reframed, not as separating factors, but as those things that make us uniquely us. So let's move on to the third and final area. What are your tips for having a more productive conversation? So I think number one, be aware of your intention in that conversation. As we see in this social media era, uh, discussions often tend to be a case of, I want to win and I want to prove that I am right and you are wrong. Whereas in this space, you really need to shift into an intention of understanding and keep that front of mind. So it's not, I have a point of view and I am fighting against yours. It is, I want to understand where you're coming from. What is your experience? 
why do you feel the way you feel? Absolutely. I think it was Stephen Covey who said, you know, seek first to understand. Yeah. And any other tips? Respond to what's actually being said as opposed to what you think you heard. Uh, we, we see a lot in these conversations that they tend to break down because instead of us actually listening to the specifics of what was said and responding to that, we react to the meaning we've put on things or what we think is going to be said even before we've gotten there. So a classic example of this is with Black Lives Matter. Uh, a lot of the time the response to, the response to it is, well, all lives matter. How can you say that only black lives matter? But that's not been said. What was said that black lives matter, which objectively on its own, if you do believe that all lives matter should be part of that statement, you should hear the as well. But what we're, what we're saying is that in this moment, right, there is a house on fire that needs support, that needs a firefighter to come and put that fire out. That is not the right time to then be pouring water on all the houses on the street while ignoring the one on fire. Beautiful metaphor. <laughs> and do you have a third recommendation in terms of tip? Uh, yeah, I think it's so important in those conversations to stay reflective, to stay self-reflective, to try to understand where that person is coming from and going through. This is different from putting yourself in their shoes because what we don't want to do is take them out of the story and put yourself in the center because then you lose it. You lose sight of who you're trying to understand. What you instead want to do is stand beside them as they are showing you something. Stand beside and still have them as that focal point because you are still seeing it from their perspective. I know from my own personal experience that sometimes when I hear somebody's story, I feel a combination of rage and guilt. So I guess what you're saying to me is not then to make it about how I'm feeling, but to bring my attention back to the other person and how it must be for them and how they're feeling. Exactly. Um, I think particularly with guilt, guilt is such a, it's a typical response, but I don't think it's a particularly productive one as opposed to that empathy and sympathetic response of going I understand you I can see where you're coming from what you're feeling and I want to act out of that sympathy that empathy for your experience as opposed to trying to assuage my guilt absolutely Thank you so much, Richard. Um, our conversations before today and today's discussion have been incredibly useful for me to, to really understand and celebrate diversity and know what it is that I can do on a day-to-day -day basis to help move the dial from tension to trust more of the time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So, to wrap up, let me summarise the key takeaways from this video. If you want to be part of the solution in reducing racial tension and building trust one conversation at a time, you can focus on these three key areas. One, just get started. It's uncomfortable for everyone. Allow yourself to be vulnerable with grace and patience. Two, nurture understanding and trust by acknowledging and celebrating both the differences and the similarities. And three, Go in with the intention to first understand, to respond to what has actually been said and not the meaning you're putting on it. And finally, stand beside them to understand what it really feels like for them. Now I'd love to hear from you. Please leave your comments in the section below this video. What did you find most useful? What small changes are you going to make? And who would you like to share this with? I look forward to seeing you back here next month. And in the meantime, be well and thrive.